Well, good morning. I don't know what you could hear. I noticed last night, for some reason, you can't hear that video very well. But he says, after they stole the gold, no matter how much drink they had, no matter how much pleasurable company they had, it could not satisfy them. And here is the long and short of the message today, and here's what I want you to know. If you're not a Christian, I want you to know that no amount of money, no amount of uh, leisure, uh, no, no number of vacations, Tracy and Brian, who are watching online from Italy. We talked about jealousy in Sunday school this morning. <clears throat> Looks like a great trip. If Steve talks about another cruise. <laughs> anyway, congratulations on your trip. But um, no matter how many things you do, without Christ, it never satisfies. But I also want you to know today, Christian, when you live in the power of the Holy Spirit, when you forsake sin to pursue righteousness, His joy fills you. One of the things that people don't know, and I actually heard Steve Brown say this recently, he said... Uh, uh, you know, early Christians called the Holy Spirit the happy spirit. And you can't tell that by most Christians' faces, um, right? And, and, and yet, today, as we talk about this idea of being made alive in Christ, um, I want to encourage you to look at your life and re recognize, am I satisfied? Do I recognize what Christ has done for me? And am I living satisfied. And so Paul talks about this in Ephesians 2, so we're going to go there in just a minute, but I've got to give an announcement because somebody forgot and they tell the pastor, you have to say this for me. So uh, for those of you who don't know, butterflies are due this week. They're selling them right out there, so go out there. And Mother's Day is next weekend, and then you ready for this? Then we're going to recognize graduates the weekend after that. And then the weekend after that, I think, is the spring fling or summer fling or whatever we call it. And then the week after that, I have no idea because I can only memorize a few things at a time. Uh, but lots of stuff coming up, great stuff. And, and we're ending this series this week, and I'm going to give a special message next week. And then I'm going to be starting a series on 1 Samuel. I haven't decided what to call it yet. I was thinking Sam he was. But um, <laughs> Dr. Seuss... It, Okay, never mind. I was, I was going to call it Summer of Sam. My wife said, you can't call it that. I'm like, what, is that something bad? I don't know. So anyway, so in the last few weeks, we talked about, but it was Easter when we started this series, so we talked about uh, the resurrection, and then we talked about being called, Matthew chapter 9, and then we talked about being sent, Luke chapter 9, and then we talked last week about being empowered, Mark chapter 5, which is like the strangest passage I've ever talked on, and some demoniac kind of guy, if you didn't get to hear that one last week, you might want to listen to that one, and then this week we're going to talk about Ephesians 2 and being made alive in Christ. Now, how many of you have ever done construction on your own house? You've done some type of construction. How many of your wife told you, do not attend? No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to do that. So um, last night in the middle of church, we had a debate about what this is called. The stick of pain is what we're going to call it now. So I think the most used name is tamp bar or I think it says on here, tamping bar. And uh, because of the type of bar it is. Uh, but there's apparently 400 names for it. My dad used to call it a breaker bar, but that's not what a breaker bar is. That's something mechanics use, so he totally mislabeled it. But it doesn't matter when you're on a construction site. When your dad says, go get a tool, it doesn't matter what he calls it. You better come back with it. <laughs> so years ago when we got our house, we had slippery, awful, small tile all through the house. And knowing my mom was moving in with us, I said, we've got to do something about this tile. But in order to do that, because the tile was a different height than the carpeted surfaces, we either had to fill in the carpeted surfaces or take out all the tile. So we decided to take out all the tile. <clears throat> a huge mistake. And yet we did. By the way, halfway through that, all the pipes in the house broke. And that's another story for another day. Thankfully, we hadn't moved in yet. But anyway, so when I first went to get the tile, I knew to go and get a tool to try to pull the tile up. 
I was smart enough, and I know that's a debatable thing for many people, but I, <laughs> Bill's like, yeah, I'm not so sure. But I was smart enough to know that I could not just grab tile off the ground with my hands and pull it up. I had to have something to help me. So, so here's what I want you to think about. Without Christ, Paul says that we're dead. And it's worse than just needing the right tool. Not only do you not have the right tools, you don't have the ability to save yourself. And so the truth is, not only do you need the tool, you need the Savior who brings it. And that's what salvation is. And so just like if I was to try to peel up tile with my hands and you would think, you're not as smart as I thought you weren't, right? You're dumber than a bag of hammers. Just like you wouldn't try that without the right tool, trying to make salvation on your own is just as insane. You, you can't do enough good works. You can't light enough candles. You can't say enough prayers. You can't go to church enough. You can't, I know it's hard for a pastor to say what I'm about to say. You can't give enough money to be saved. I know, it'd be great for us if it was, right? Right? But the truth is, it has nothing to do with your salvation. It's all about the tools that Christ brings because you and I are dead without salvation. And so that's what Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. And that's where we're going to camp today. And we're going to use a couple of supporting verses. But, but here's the deal. If you and I as Christians, those of you who are here that are Christians, if we're going to live this satisfied life, we have to recognize what Jesus has done in us and allow him to continue and continually work on us and in us. So let me give you a few points today from Ephesians chapter 2. Number one, what we deserved because of our sin. If you're going to appreciate anything in the present, you have to look back and recognize what has been done for you, what's been done in the past. What were you saved from? And then we'll get to what are we saved for. Here's what we picks up in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3. As for you, Christian, it's talking to Christians here. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Now, many of us don't know the difference between sins and transgressions, so I'll give it to you. Sins is like any time you miss the mark. We do it all the time. By the way, I've only had one person in all my years of ministry, when I said to them, are you a sinner? They said no. One person. Most people have the most creative answers. So if you're, if you're at a bar and you want to talk to somebody about Jesus, a great first question is not, do you know Jesus? A great first question is, are you a sinner? To which, these are the answers I've gotten that are some of my favorites. I'm really good at it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Unbelievably good, right? All these kind of answers about the fact that all of us know we sin. We all know we miss the mark. We all know we mess up. We all know that. Transgressions are not just sin. Transgressions is when you knowably sin. It's when you're driving down the road and you realize you're speeding and then you're very, very aware of it as you notice there's a lot of police out today. <clears throat> there's a lot of police out today. And, and so transgressions are when you willfully choose. And we've all done that where we know what we should do. We know we shouldn't say what we're about to say to somebody. <laughs> that got a little too much response. You guys are too much like me. And then it says, you were dead in your transgressions and sin in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world. Now, this word for follows is really cool because it means to walk around. But it literally means to walk around. It means literally to walk in circles. As you walked in circles, you just kept doing the same thing over and over again. By the way, they say if you get lost uh, in the desert or if you get lost in a forest and you try to get out and you don't know where you are, you will walk in circles. Did you know that? And the reason why is one of your legs is stronger than the other, so you just tend to walk in circles. In our nature, in our natural selves, we tend to fall into habits where we do the same thing over and over. We make the same mistakes, we do the same sins, we pursue the same things, and without Jesus, there's no getting out. It's just you walk around and around. You're like a one-legged duck. 
Just swim round and round and round, right? The ways of this world, so you're followed the ways of this world and the rulers of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. And so the idea is you were dead. You had no sensitivity to spiritual things. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings. And we all understand cravings. I had a donut this morning here at church. It just looks so good. And every week it looks so good. Don't tell my wife. She's watching online. All right. So all of us lived among them, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and followed not only its desires, but I like this, and thoughts. So not only what we desire, but how we think about life. Do we just settle in to satisfying our desire? Do we say it doesn't matter what I do as long as I'm sincere? Do, do we say things like, well, I should be able to do whatever I want to do. And that's not sin as long as I feel like it. And so that's the way of the world. And then it continues. Like the rest, we were by nature, listen to this, deserving of wrath. So typically when I say to somebody, this is not the part of the sermon that I have to convince anybody of anything. Because when I say to people, are you a sinner? They go, uh-huh. Yep. Yepper. By the way, the one guy who told me he wasn't a sinner actually admitted that he used to sin. He just doesn't anymore. I'll tell you who it was later. It's really funny. All right. So when you realize what Jesus did for you and you recognize your brokenness, as a Christian, it brings you joy. It helps you to be thankful. Did you guys see the lady, the video this week of the lady who got out of her car, she had her car door open, had a baby in a stroller, and it started rolling towards the highway? Did anybody see that video this week? It made national news and everything. Started rolling towards the highway. The lady, it's a great aunt or something, and she was like on the ground, legs up, babies rolling into traffic. I mean, traffic's right there. Babies rolling. And some dude out of nowhere sprints. I mean, full sprint, stops the cart. Now, I wasn't there to listen, but I'm guessing that that lady was slightly appreciative. I'm sure as that child grows up and gets to watch the video, they'll say, thank you so much. Many of us haven't really taken the time to recognize that there is no joy in life. There is no true joy in life. There's pleasure that's temporary. There, there's fulfillment that's temporary. But true joy only comes from a relationship with Christ. And when we recognize that the only way I can really have joy, the only way I can be redeemed from my sinful, broken self is through Jesus, then we become, begin to become thankful. Listen to what it says here. Do not offer, Romans 6, 13, any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather do what? Offer yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. For sin shall no longer be your master, because you're not under the law, but under grace. Now, 1 John tells us that if you walk in darkness, how can you call yourself a believer? And I think of it this way. How many of you were like me, and you probably knew not to touch the stove, but you did one time? Anybody here? Now, I remember we had a few people. Um, I think Bob told me to touch the stove like five times. So that's the only guy I know that, that hit 440 to put a fuse in, got 440 shocked, passed out, got up, and tried it again. Only guy I ever knew, right? But most of us, most of us, other than Bob, most of us touch a stove once, and guess what? No more. One time, Right? As a believer, when you sin, you should feel regret. You, you should feel conviction. Conviction and condemnation are two different things, by the way. Let me, let me kind of specify the difference. Condemnation says you can never overcome. That's who you are. That's not from God. Conviction says this is what you did and you need to make it right. 
That's conviction, okay? Big difference between those two. If, if, if you're you know, going through your day and all of a sudden you hear, you're a terrible father, well, you can't do anything about that. If you hear, don't cuss at your children, gosh, I hope you hear that one, right? I hope you don't hear that one, right? So those, that's something you can do something about. That's conviction. Conviction is something fixable. If you can sin, if you can do whatever you want and you have no conviction, no conscience, then my question is, are you sure you're really a Christian? Because if I went and put my hand on a stove today and was standing there and you saw smoke coming out and you smelt bacon, because I'm sure my skin smells like bacon by now, <laughs> and you came up and said, Eric, Eric, your hand is on the stove. It is? You would know something was dead in my hand. If you're able to do whatever you want, you're able to walk in any sin you want, pursue any lifestyle you want, pursue any sin you want, treat people as me, you have no conviction about anything. Then my question is, are you sure you're alive to Christ? Because if you're alive to Christ, there will be regret, there will be conviction. I'm not talking condemnation, don't hear me the wrong way, but it's something you can do something about. And the reason the Holy Spirit convicts us is why? So that we can change. So that we don't just gratify the desires of our flesh. Because by the way, no matter how long you've been a Christian, those old flesh habits, even though you've been renewed and made new in Christ, those old flesh habits still hang in there. I chew gum a lot at my house, all the time. Because here's what I've discovered. If I'm not chewing gum, I find things in my mouth. Potato chips, anything, anything. If I leave a bag of whatever on the counter, I don't even know I ate it, and the bag is empty. So what do I do? That's an old habit. I just walk by like a pig, like a big pig. So I chew gum like a pig. I don't swallow the gum, but I chew gum. Why do I do that? Because I'm trying to break this old habit. We have old flesh habits that hang in, the way we treat people, the way we think about life, the things that we think matter and don't matter. And we have to say to God, God, through your Holy Spirit, as I read your word, would you convict me? Would you convict me of what's not right? And Holy Spirit, convict me of what's right. That's your first question. Have you grieved over your sin? When you find that you're struggling, when you know of an area of sin, you sometimes need to, as the Bible says in the Old Testament, taste and see that God's good. We have to taste the sin sometimes and recognize, you know what, God, I really am messed up. You know, we're so worried about kids having good self-esteem, and yet so many of us as parents feel like failures. We want to tell other people, oh, you just need to feel good about yourself, when the truth is we don't. But can I tell you a secret that I know? It's sometimes good for you not to feel good about yourself. Eric, don't say that. That's terrible. I need self-esteem. I'm not talking about self-esteem. I'm talking about self-awareness. Recognizing that you don't have it all together. Recognizing that you are broken and you are messed up and sometimes you fail and you falter. And guess what? You have areas of weakness. And it's okay to say, I struggle. That's called being vulnerable and being a real person. And recognizing that without Christ, there's no hope. There's no satisfaction. But here's what's awesome. With Christ, it doesn't stop there. And so we're getting to the good news. Don't worry. Number two, God loves us and sets us free. So one of our members that's here this morning told me a story. I'm not going to embarrass her too much. And I won't say her name today because I, I didn't get permission. But she, years ago, I think she said 10 years ago, she had somebody she was with have a heart attack and fall down on the ground and die. Their heart stopped beating. So she knew what to do. She gave the person CPR back in the old days when you had to do mouth to mouth. By the way, you don't do that anymore. You just... Just keep, got to keep that heart going now. That's all they want you to do. And so she, she gave it until the, until the uh, paramedics arrived and revived the person. And the person to this day is still alive. I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, she must be really grateful for you. Said, yeah. Now, here's the thing. As a Christian, you and I need to recognize we were dead to anything spiritual. 
We were dead to anything that really mattered in life. And Jesus helped us to rise from the dead. He loved us so much that he set us free from all those chains. And yet, so many of us lay back on the ground and go, I'm dying! If somebody came in that had just had heart surgery and laid on the ground in church and started yelling, I'm dying, we would get them psychiatric care, right? And yet, so many Christians love to say, I'm just a sinner. If you're a Christian, you can no longer say, I'm just a sinner. That's actually a lie. Now, you could say, I was a sinner, and now I've been saved by grace. Oh, Eric, that is presumptuous. No, it's not. It's the Bible. Listen to what Paul says. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in, what's the next word? Mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. And then he says this, it is by grace you have been saved. It doesn't say by works. It doesn't say a bunch of prayers. It doesn't say a bunch of candles. It doesn't say a bunch of, uh, a bunch of giving to the church. It says you're saved by his grace. And then it continues, and God raised us up with Christ. And listen to this, seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now, I understand you, if somebody said, where are you sitting today? I hope you wouldn't tweet or Facebook note, I'm sitting in heaven because they would think you were gone. Because the truth is, physically, you're sitting here. But positionally, the Bible says you're seated with Christ. And then it show, shows the future and says this, in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us. In Christ Jesus. So Paul's saying, before you were under God's wrath, you were dead. You had no strength of your own. But because of Jesus, you are now seated with Jesus. It's an awesome thought that most of us never grasp. Some of us who've been Christians a long time struggle with this very thing. Because we say, but I'm just a sinner. No, not anymore. If you still think you're just a sinner, you're, you're like somebody who the lifeguard pulls out of the water and you lay on the beach and say, I'm drowning. Psychological care, right? Romans 6.22 says it this way, but now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, by the way, my question would be, are you really living as a slave of God? Are you really surrendering and submitting to God? Or is your hand still on the stove and you're just calling yourself a Christian? You're really dead to Christ, but you're calling yourself a believer. A lot of people say things with their mouth, but are we really living it? Have we really surrendered our lives to God? Have we really become slaves to Christ? And then it continues. The benefit you reap leads to holiness and the result is eternal life. Why? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I never forget years ago, I had a pastor and he had two words over his desk on the, on the shelf behind his head. And here they were. Yes, Lord. If you want to live a satisfying life, if you're a believer, well, I would say if you're not a believer, then starting by surrendering your life to Christ is the first step. But if you're a believer and you've noticed that you've lost the love, you've lost the joy, You've lost the peace. Those are called the fruits of the Spirit. And what happens is when we do whatever we want and we pursue whatever we want and we put the big I first, we begin to lose those fruits of the Spirit and we become dissatisfied with life. Like Solomon said, vanity, vanity, all is vanities. No matter how much you have, it's not enough. And yet with God, little is enough. You know, they've done studies of the wealthy and the poor, and both can be miserable. Did you know that? But they've also discovered that the money has nothing to do with happiness. And you can pursue all kinds of pleasure, leisure, but without Christ, it's empty. The wages of sin is death, but what? The gift of God is eternal life. So have you received that gift of life? Let me ask you the second question. Have you celebrated your freedom in Christ. Do I celebrate my freedom in Christ? So the question for you, us, the number two question is, have you? 
Do you take time to say, God, thank you for what you've done for me? You ever have those days you look in the mirror and you're just disappointed with yourself? You even let yourself down. Your doctor says to you, lose five pounds. You say, okay, doc. Six months later, you see the doctor and you say, I've had a five pound change, doc. And he goes, yeah, you're up five pounds, right? And you're like, oh, well, that wasn't exactly the change I was looking for. And you disappoint yourself. Can I tell you something? I know we try to shield kids from this. Sometimes it's okay to recognize that. I even let myself down sometimes. God, I need you. God, I need your grace. And what's awesome about salvation is it's not based on how good your pastor is, which is a good thing because somebody tailgated me this morning and I lost my salvation for a few minutes. It was a motorcycle. I was so tempted to hit the brakes and just remind him of how small he was. See? See what goes through my mind? It's just not Satan. It's just Satan on the way to church. So we deserve death because of sin. God loves us and set us free. Number three, we've been given a grace gift. Have you ever been given an awesome gift? A few years ago, I, I, my kids, we enjoy at Christmas time Trans-Siberian Orchestra. I don't know if you ever heard them, but they're like the rock 80s. If you've ever seen them, they're like still in the 80s. It's like striper Christmas music. It really is. That's probably the best. And, and so I wanted to take the kids, and I looked at tickets. I said, we can't afford to go. Sorry, guys. A friend of mine who goes here to church called me and said, hey, this guy I work with has a box seat to Trans-Siberian Orchestra. You can invite up to 10 people. Do you want to go? Nope. No, I didn't do that. Didn't do that. That'd be awesome. So we go. We have a special entrance. We go in. There's food. Food. We got to go. We had this little box, and you eat, and then you sit down, and then you eat, and then you sit down, and then you eat, and then you sit down. You got to go to the bathroom. Just walk to the little bathroom. Then you go eat, and then you sit down. It's great. We're watching Tri Sam. It was an awesome gift, but nothing compared to salvation. Do you realize that God knows every thought you've ever had, and He still loves you? I mean, can you imagine if all of a sudden in church I said bubble thought and bubble thoughts popped up and whatever you were thinking of was exposed to everyone? (laughs) Music for the final countdown. Bubble. Bacon. Bubble. Right? Whatever you were thinking. Listen, God knows all of that. And here's what's awesome. God knows not only your thoughts, He knows the intentions of your heart. So even when you come and go, Pastor, that was a great sermon today. He knows all of that. And he knows why you said it. And yet he still loves us. He knows all about you. And grace is all about the fact that he knows that you're broken. He knows you can't overcome. He knows that just like Peter, Peter, I know what you're going to do a few days from now or tomorrow. And guess what? I still love you. Feed my sheep. For it is by grace, Ephesians 2.8, you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. You don't have the tools. It is a gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork. I already talked to the kids about that. You'll have to go back to that sermon for that. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So not only does Jesus save you, He created you, and He has an assignment for you. Some of us, first of all, don't recognize God's grace. And then some of us don't recognize that God made us special for a purpose. And if we get that far, sometimes we don't realize that He has an assignment for each of us. I want to encourage you this week to pay attention to that assignment everywhere you go. You are a special creation of God created with a purpose and God wants to use you every day. So how can he use you? Are you aware of that? Are you looking for those opportunities? See, one of the reasons that some of us are not walking in joy is because we haven't taken what God has given us and given it away. And sometimes when you give away what God's given to you, that's when you find the joy. When you recognize, he didn't give this to me for me. He gave this to me so that I could bless someone else with it. So what has God given you that you can bless somebody else? It might be as simple as he's given you a great ability to cook soup. 
Romans 3, 22, this righteousness is given through faith in Jesus to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. Why? For all have sinned and fall short. That's the whole meaning of sin. It's to fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. I want to end where I started. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that today. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But I also want to remind you that we all let ourselves down. Yesterday, I went to a um, work day with my uh, community. They had a community work day. I was there for five minutes. Five minutes. They said, we're going to pull these vines down. I started pulling the vines, immediately broke a sprinkler. Immediately. Pulling vines, sprinkler way over there. Apparently, the vine was way over there. Broke the sprinkler in half. I mean, it did not take me but a couple minutes. But that wasn't the worst spot. Then I'm cutting vines back with my, I brought my hedge trimmers and they said, I want you to cut all these vines down this thing. So I'm cutting them down the wall and then I'm going down the fence line and all of a sudden at the fence line, I hit something. I'm like, whoa, I'm in the middle of a bunch of vines. There's a wire and it is the controller for the entire sprinkler system for the whole development. And I immediately heard a voice in my head, idiot. Look at that. You did it again, trying to help somebody. By the way, I'm the only pastor you know that has destroyed somebody's welcome mat with his lawnmower. I have done that. Did you know there's suction in a lawnmower? If you didn't know that, I just want to teach you that lesson. Stay away from your welcome mat with your lawnmower. By the way, I've killed my own one and and somebody else's. But you look and you go, wow, what a dummy you are. I'm not so worried about your self-esteem. Because here's the deal. When you recognized how broken you are and yet how loved you are anyway, that's self-esteem. It's recognizing, although I will never be perfect, although I will sometimes do dumb things, although I sometimes will pursue a sin, sometimes I run from God, He still runs after me and loves me. By grace, I'm saved through faith. Now, if you have no conscience when you sin, then it could be that you're not a believer. And so today I want to encourage you, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, maybe you would say, I don't know if I'm a Christian or not, but I want to know from this day forward. And I surrender my life to Christ afresh and anew, knowing that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. I want to surrender my life to him. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian, but the truth is you're not living in the joy of the Christian life, either because you're pursuing sin or you have not recognized how good His grace is that He brings the tools you need to be alive. If you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I'll be here after the service and we can talk about what it means to be a Christian and you can pray with me and you can pray to give your life to Jesus today before you leave. Christians, I want you to live in the joy of the Lord satisfied because of his presence. Let's close in prayer today. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your gift of salvation. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, thank you that while we were still sinners, you died for us. So Father, thank you that you love us that much. Father, we understand what it means to put aside old things and to pursue you. But Lord, even when we fail and falter, you said when we confess our sins, that you are still faithful and you forgive us. So, Lord, we receive that forgiveness. We choose to walk in your presence today. Thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a great song to close.